humans. Wow, I have fluffy hair today. Oh, and I totally have chocolate on my face. Can you tell that I was just eating chocolate? Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hello, humans. Um, welcome to chapter 11. Uh, I have been doing zoo stuff all morning and clearly eating Whitakers. Um, and I still feel like there's chocolate there. Don't mind me while I sort out my situation. Um, and I went to the doctor this morning and confirmed that he has thoroughly removed my Ian baby, which is very good news. And I am hoping that some of you are going to show up and listen to me read about the French Revolution. Um, we're reading The Scarlet Pimpernel, as you probably know. I posted a link in all the social medias this morning about that linked to the playlist on YouTube that has all the previous chapters in it. So if you are not up to date, you can get up to date really easily. But as we said yesterday, this book is not the fastest moving story in the world. So um, it shouldn't be too hard to figure out what's going on, even if you've missed a couple of chapters. <clears throat> the short version so far is that we have Marguerite Blakeney, who is from France, and she married an Englishman. And her brother has just gone back to France to do some shady shit and maybe rescue some people or maybe be part of the revolution. It's a bit vague, to be honest. Um, and there is a French dude from the government of France, from the public something or other, um, and he is trying to get her to help him identify the Scarlet Pimpernel, who is whisking aristocrats out of France from under the nose of the revolutionaries. Um, and he wants to know who this guy is so he can stop them. It seems that this, the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel is just full of young British bucks who love the adventure of, you know, whisking aristocrats out, out before they can get their heads chopped off. Um, and she is sympathetic towards the Republicans, but does not like the um, extreme measures that some of the re revolutionaries have taken. And, but she doesn't really want to help Mr. Nasty French Dude because he's kind of mean. Um, and, but now he's threatening her brother. So she is about to go to a ball where she has to try to figure out who the Scarlet Pimpernel is. Otherwise, Chauvelin will get her brother's head on the guillotine. Uh, it's very dramatic. Hey, Ardbeck, what does Gnar mean? Did I say it right? That's where we're at. Um, so, yeah. Shall we dive right in to chapter 11, Lord Grenville's Ball, which I'm hoping is not as long as yesterday's one, because I oh know it's not that long, this one. Um, my throat was real sore after yesterday's chapter was a doozy, man. Uh, right. Ah, well, random screaming, garbling, welcome to you too. Uh, it's nice to have you back. I look forward to you mocking my French as usual. Here we go. The historic ball given by the then Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Lord Grenville, was the most brilliant function of the year. Through, though the autumn season had only just begun, everybody who was anybody had contrived to be in London in time to be present there, and to shine at this ball to the best of his or her respective ability. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, had promised to be present. He was coming on presently from the opera. Lord Granville himself had listened to the f two first acts of Orpheus before preparing to receive his guests. At ten o'clock, an unusually late hour in those days, the grand rooms of the Foreign Office, exquisitely decorated with exotic palms and flowers, were filled to overflowing. One room had been set apart for dancing, and the dainty strains of the minuet made a soft accompaniment to the gay chatter, the merry laughter of the numerous and brilliant company. In a small chamber facing the top of the fine stairway, the distinguished host stood ready to receive his guests. Distinguished men, beautiful women, notabilities from every European country had already filed past him, had exchanged the elaborate bows and curtsies with him, which the extravagant fashion of the time demanded, and then, 
laughing and talking, had dispersed in the ball, reception and card rooms beyond. Not far from Lord Grenville's elbow, leaning against one of the console tables, Chauvelin, in his irreproachable black costume, was taking a quiet survey of the brilliant throng. He noted that Sir Percy and Lady Blakeney had not yet arrived, and his keen, pale eyes glanced quickly towards the door every time a newcomer appeared. He stood somewhat isolated. The envoy of the revolutionary government of France was not likely to be very popular in England, at a time when the news of the awful September massacres and of the reign of terror and anarchy had just begun to filtrate across the Channel. In his official capacity, he had been received courteously by his English colleagues. Mr. Pitt had shaken him by the hand. Lord Grenville had entertained him more than once, but the more intimate circles of London society ignored him altogether. The women openly turned their backs upon him. The men who held no official position refused to shake his hand. But Chauvelin was not the man to trouble himself about these social amenities, which he called mere incidents in his diplomatic career. He was blindly enthusiastic for the revolutionary cause. He despised all social inequalities and had a burning love for his own country. These three sentiments made him supremely indifferent to the snubs he received in this fog-ridden, loyalist, old-fashioned England. But above all, Chauvelin had a purpose at heart. He firmly believed that the French aristocrat was the most bitter enemy of France. He would have wished to see every one of them annihilated. He was one of those who, during this awful reign of terror, had been the first to utter the historic and ferocious desire that aristocrats might have but one head between them, so that it might be cut off with a single stroke of the guillotine. And thus he looked upon every French aristocrat who had succeeded in escaping from France, as so much prey of which the guillotine had been unwarrantably cheated. There is no doubt that those royalist émigrés, once they had managed to cross the frontier, did their very best to stir up foreign indignation against France. Plots without end were hatched in England, in Belgium, and Holland, to try and induce some great power to send troops into revolutionary Paris, to, to free King Louis, and to summarily hang the bloodthirsty leaders of that monster republic. Small wonder, therefore, that the romantic and mysterious personality of the Scarlet Pimpernel was a source of bitter hatred to Chauvelin. He and the few young jackanapes under his command, well furnished with money, armed with boundless daring and acute cunning, had succeeded in rescuing hundreds of aristocrats from France. Nine-tenths of the émigrés who were fated at the English court owed their safety to that man and to his league. Chauvelin had sworn to his colleagues in Paris that he would discover the identity of that meddlesome Englishman, entice him over to France, and then Chauvelin drew a deep breath of satisfaction at the very thought of seeing that enigmatic head falling under the hip under the knife of the guillotine as easily as that of any other man. Suddenly there was a great stir on the handsome staircase. All conversation stopped for a moment as the major domo's voice outside announced, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, and sweet, Sir Percy Blakeney, Lady Blakeney. Lord Grenville went quickly to the door to receive his exalted guest. The Prince of Wales, dressed in a magnificent court suit of salmon-coloured velvet richly embroidered with gold, entered with Marguerite Blakeney on his arm, and on his left, Sir Percy, in gorgeous, shimmering cream satin, cut in the extravagant, incroyable style, his fair hair free from powder, priceless lace at his neck and wrists, and the flat chapeau bras under his arm. After the few conventional words of deferential greeting, Lord Grenville said to his royal guest, Will your highness permit me to introduce Monsieur Chevalin, the accredited agent of the French government? Chevalin immediately, the prince entered, had stepped forward, expecting this introduction. He bowed very low, whilst the prince returned his salute with a curt nod of the head. Monsieur, said His Royal Highness coldly, we will try to forget the government that sent you and look upon you merely as our guest, a private gentleman from France. As such, you are welcome, Monsieur. Monseigneur, rejoined Chauvelin, bowing once again. Madame, he added, bowing ceremoniously before Marguerite. Ah, my little Chauvelin, she said with unconcerned gaiety and extending her tiny hand to him. Monsieur and I are old friends, your royal highness. Ah, then, said the prince, this time very graciously, you are doubly welcome, monsieur. There is someone else I would crave permission to present to your royal highness, here interposed Lord Granville. Ah, who is it? asked the prince. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserif and her family, who have but recently come from France. By all means, they are among the lucky ones, then. Lord Grenville turned in search of the Comtesse, who sat at the further end of the room. Lord love me, whispered His Royal Highness to Marguerite, as soon as he had caught sight of the rigid figure of the old lady. Lord love me, she looks very virtuous and very melancholy. 
faith, your royal highness, she rejoined with a smile. Virtue is like precious odours, most fragrant when it is crushed. Virtue, alas, sighed the prince, is mostly unbecoming to your charming sex, madame. Madame la Comtesse de Tournay de Basserive, said Lord Granville, introducing the lady. This is a pleasure, madame. My royal father, as you know, is ever glad to welcome those of your compatriots whom France has driven from her shores. Your royal highness is ever gracious, replied the Comtesse with becoming dignity. Then, indicating her daughter, who stood timidly by her side, my daughter Suzanne, Monseigneur, she said. Ha, ah, charming, charming, said the prince. And now allow me, Comtesse, to introduce you Lady Blakeney, who honours us with her friendship. You and she will have much to say to one another, I vow. Every compatriot of Lady Blakeney's is doubly welcome for her sake. Our, her friends are our friends. Her enemies, the enemies of England. Marguerite's blue eyes had twinkled with merriment at this gracious speech from her exalted friend. The Comtesse de Tournay, who lately had so flagrantly insulted her, was here receiving a public lesson at which Marguerite could not help but rejoice. But the Comtesse, for whom respect of royalty amounted almost to a religion, was too well schooled in courtly etiquette to show the slightest sign of embarrassment, as the two ladies curtsied ceremoniously to one another. His Royal Highness is ever gracious, madame, said Marguerite, demurely, and with a wealth of mischief in her twinkling blue eyes. But here there is no need for this kind of meditation. Your amiable reception of me at our last meeting still dwells pleasantly in my memory. We poor exiles, madame, rejoined the Comtesse frigidly, show our gratitude to England by devotion to the wishes of Monseigneur. Madame, said Marguerite, with another ceremonious curtsy. Madame, responded the Comtesse, with equal dignity. The prince, in the meanwhile, was saying a few gracious words to the young vicomte. I am happy to know you, Monsieur le vicomte, he said. I knew your father well when he was ambassador in London. Ah, Monseigneur, replied the vicomte, I was a little boy then, and now I owe the honour of this meeting to our protector, the Scarlet Pimpernel. Hush, said the prince earnestly and quickly, as he indicated Chauvelin, who had stood a little on one side throughout the whole of this little scene, watching Marguerite and the Comtesse with an amused, sarcastic little smile around his thin lips. Nay, Monseigneur, he said now, as if in direct response to the Prince's challenge. Pray, do not check this gentleman's display of gratitude. The name of that interesting red flower is well known to me, and to France. The Prince looked at him keenly for a moment or two. Faith then, Monsieur, he said. Perhaps you know more about our national hero than we do ourselves. Perchance you know who he is. See, he added, turning to the groups around the room, the ladies hang upon your lips. You would render yourself popular among the fair sex if you were to gratify their curiosity. Ah, Monseigneur, said Chauvelin significantly, rumour has it in France that your highness could, and you would, give the truest account of that enigmatical wayside flower. He looked quickly and keenly at Marguerite as he spoke, but she betrayed no emotion and her eyes met his quite fear fearlessly. Nay, man, replied the prince, my lips are sealed, and the members of the League jealously guard the secret of their chief so his fair adorers have to be content with worshipping a shadow. Here in England, Monsieur, he added, with wonderful charm and dignity, we but name the Scarlet Pimpernel, and every fair cheek is suffused with a blush of enthusiasm. None have seen him, save his faithful lieutenants. We know not if he be tall or short, fair or dark, handsome or ill-formed, but we know that he is the bravest gentleman in all the world, and we all feel a little proud, Monsieur, when we remember that he is an Englishman. Ah, Monsieur Chauvelin, added Marguerite, looking almost with defiance across at the placid, sphinx-like face of the Frenchman. His Royal Highness should add that we ladies think of him as, as of a hero of old. We worship him. We wear his badge. We tremble for him when he is in danger and exult with him in the hour of his victory. Chauvelin did no more than bow placidly, both to the Prince and to Marguerite. He felt that both speeches were intended, each in their way, to convey contempt or defiance. The pleasure-loving idle prince he despised. The beautiful woman, who in her golden hair wore a spray of small red flowers composed of rubies and diamonds. Her he held in the hollow of hand. He could afford to remain silent and to wait events. A long, jovial, inane laugh broke the sudden silence which had fallen over everyone. And we poor husbands came in slow, affected accents from gorgeous Sir Percy. We have to stand by while they worship a damned shadow. Everyone laughed, the prince more loudly than anyone. The tension of subdued excitement was relieved, and the next moment everyone was laughing and chatting mer merrily as the gay crowd broke up and dispersed in the ad adjoining rooms. The end of that chapter. I'm going to catch up. Coffee, barbecue, beer, Xbox, repeat. Sounds good.
I was catching up on you two having your little chat. Seems like coffee is a staple for everybody. Mine is like coffee, book, work, phone games, book, sleep, nap, 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 nap. I'm having a lot of naps. Um, so how are you all doing? How's your little girl out back? Oh my god, he sent me a video of his little girl singing along to like Rammstein and stuff the other day. Which is very cute, but I still think you need to give her some tailor. A well-rounded education is important for a young child. She's going to rebel when she's like 16 and start listening to pop music if you're not careful. <laughs> like real crappy auto-tuned pop music. Man, they grow up fast, eh? At that age. Jeez. My kidlet is at his dad's at the moment and he's taken to sending me... Her mum does his... <laughs> Fair enough. Um, he's taken to sending me videos of himself playing Roblox. <laughs> because I won't let him be a YouTuber till he's 13. So he's just making videos and sending them to me. I think he's trying to convince me that he should be able to be a YouTuber. But... There's no commentary or anything, by the way. It's literally just, like, the gameplay. <laughs> like watching him run around dressed as a dog. Um, he's going to be old enough to be a YouTuber before we know it. That little boy. She's such a cutie. Poor child. Rumpstein. Alright, darlings. Um, going to go away. And kids these days. Back in the day, kids wanted to be a race car drivers and rock stars. Now they want to be YouTube stars. It's the same thing, though. They just want to be the thing that they admire. And these days, that's YouTubers. I think that almost every... All his friends are the same. They all want to be YouTubers. Um, why the hell not? Like, if that is the thing that, you know, makes them happy and it allows them to learn some technical skills and be creative, why not? Right? So, but 13, because he is, a, like his mother, a bit of a sensitive soul. And when, oh, of course Spud wants to be a race car driver, yeah, that's about right. Um... And I'm not sure he's ready yet to deal with having the kinds of comments that happen on YouTube happen to him. So, we will see how we go. What does Callan want to be, apart from something involving sport? I'm assuming he wants to be something involving sport. It's funny, I don't really have it. I remember asking Flynn once what he wanted to be when he... No, what did I say? What do you want to do when you grow up? He was like three at the time. And his response was, drink coffee. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> oh, stuntman, yeah, that would work. Except I worry that he would... Um, he's not the most careful of children. <laughs> I feel like stuntmen are extremely careful because they know how dangerous what they're doing is. That would be good, though. <laughs> really? I mean, but they take precautions and shit, don't they? They take, like, calculated risks, not just... Oh. Uh, dear. Oh, well. I think he would be well suited to it, to be honest, because he, he, he definitely bounces, which is probably an important trait in a stuntman. <laughs> Nine-year-olds will want to be YouTube stars, apparently. Um, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Still figuring that out. <laughs> <laughs> I 
you want to be a race car driver. Didn't you go and do that thing at like, there's a racetrack somewhere near Wellington where you can go and drive race cars. I'm sure you did that thing. Well, I feel like you did. Did I make that up? Adam, we should like get you in one of those things. You would have so much fun. <laughs> Was it cool? Are there any near Hamilton? Or is that the only one that does it? I have very fluffy hair today, you guys. Because I washed it last night and then slept while it was wet still. Oh, okay. Here we go. You two should meet up and have a track day once you're allowed to travel again. Because it would be fun for you, both of you. That'd be cool. Hampton Downs is in Auckland, though, right? Way rad. Will, do you like roller coasters? I need a roller coaster buddy. Adam doesn't like roller coasters. And the kids are all too small to be my roller coaster buddy still. And I love roller coasters. So I need a roller coaster buddy. Yes. Oh, it said love. <laughs> we should make that cap spamming thing not quite so violent. <laughs> Because uh, people get excited and then they get, like, timed out <laughs> because they're excited. Good. You need to sort me out on stream elements on stream lab so I can do it from Sparrow Hawk rather than from your phone. Okay. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, once you're not doing things, yeah. I'll log in and give myself access. All right. Sounds good. He thought he'd be persistent about putting spaces between them and then still <laughs> it left it there for a minute. And then he did it like three times and then it was like, nope. <laughs> nice try. It's fine. We're going to change the system. I'll let him come and do his thing after I'm done here. Um. <laughs> Who is that pest in the background? That's my prettiest princess. Didn't you see what a pretty princess he is? <laughs> He needs a tiara and a tutu. But I think we were going to do that at a tiara at 100 follows and tutu at 150 follows. So. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right, my darlings. <laughs> oh, yellow potion. Yeah, it's watered down orange juice because the orange juice was too sweet for me today. So I watered it down. That's why it's like yellow, not orange. Um, I So on Sunday, I am probably going to do a live stream of me watching Jesus Christ Superstar, which I've never seen before. Because I watched church court. <laughs> Is that what they do in church? I haven't been to church at a church, like, except for weddings and funerals since I was a kid. So. I do not know. Um, don't they have all that, like, tithe money, though? That they can spend on real orange juice? Or does it all go into communion wine? I don't know very much about churches. <laughs> Enduring memory of churches watered down orange juice cheese. I remember oh, I used to go to Sunday school when I was like little, like nine, ten or so. Um, you probably do because you got dragged to church a lot in your previous relationship. Um, and I don't remember much about it. I know that they used to give us these little storybooks that were like <laughs> yeah, Andy. They used to give us these little storybooks that were like, um, you know, didactic, moralistic tales about how you should be a good Christian. Um, and I love that because I like books. And when someone gives me free books, it you're, you get on my good side, even if they're shit books. I'm still like, whoa, free books. 
So they got me for a while on that because they were giving me books. And that's about all I remember. I think we've still got a couple of, well, mom, they were probably still a couple of them at mom and dad's house. Um, but they were all stories about, you know, like moral, moral tales, morality tales about like kids doing bad things and getting their come up and saw like being good little Christians or whatever. I don't know. That's about all I remember. I don't remember very much. And the songs, there were a lot, there was a lot of singing. It didn't last very long though, because I only went because all my friends at school were going. My parents are not religious. So I never had to go. Have you heard of the hunting of the snark? I mean, that's a Lewis Carroll poem. Is there a musical based on the hunting of the snark? Because that would be amazing. Um. <gasps> I need it. I'll have to find it. That's cool. The guy, there was a guy in Dunedin who was illustrating, oh, what was his name? David something, who was illustrating uh, the Jedi. He might have actually been illustrating The Hunting of the Snark and turning it into like a, a book, a children's book. And when I was working at Uniprint, he would bring in his drafts. Yes, do. Um, he would bring in his like draft images of it. Man, they were so super cool. I wish I could remember his name. David something. He's quite well known in New Zealand. He's one of those famous in New Zealand situations. Uh, children's author. Uh, lies. Children's illustrator. Um, David, David. I want to say Elliot. David Elliot. I'll look it up later. Um, but yeah. Wow. I had no idea there was a Hunting on the Stark musical and I need it in my life. Maybe I'll just do like Sunday morning streams of me watching musicals and or extremely bad movies that I haven't seen before and reacting to them because I feel like people were amused by my reactions to Joseph and that was just me making comments on Facebook. <laughs> you couldn't see me actually going, is that fucking Liza Minnelli? Um, <laughs> why are they suddenly Jewish? <laughs> it was like, why are we suddenly in Fiddler on the Roof? It's weird. There was definitely some fiddle on the roof plagiarism going on in that show. I'm pretty damn sure about that. Um, very weird. Very fucking weird musical. Wow. Like, wow. So, but apparently Jesus Christ Superstar is just as weird, so that should be fun. For the snark. Hmm. That is unfortunate. Is it like the Peter and the Wolf one? We had Peter and the Wolf, um, which was like a symphonic orchestra version of Peter and the Wolf when I was a kid that I used to listen to all the time, where each animal had its own little like musical bit. <laughs> You'll have to send it to me on Facebook. You're getting into trouble with my stream bot. He's yelling at you. Just post me the links on Facebook and I'll have a look. Um, and on that note, <laughs> you're allowed to swear though, as long as you do it in lowercase. <laughs> We're gonna change it. Don't stress. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's time for me to go and read a book or something. The link thing is going to stay. All right. Fair enough. Oh, uh, yeah, that's true. Cool. I think you can, like, turn it on and off, though, can't you? Can't you, like... Um, I thought there was a way in there. Yeah. Art right, back. No, apparently not. I'm sure there's a way to like temporarily. Yeah. Are you trying to get the? Yeah. So, I think the thing he's trying to do right now is um. You can. 
I have been taking these videos and putting them on YouTube in a, into a playlist so that if you missed all the previous chapters of the book, you can catch up. Uh, you don't have to listen to all the bits about me rambling, although they're there if you want to. Um, but you can catch up on the book if you are so inclined. Um, but we all set it up so that I post that link from time to time so that people know. All right, darlings, I am going to go and read my other book now and maybe stare at my phone for a bit and maybe nap and maybe have some tea. Um, you all have excellent afternoons and stay safe and stay awesome and I love you.